understandably, a lot of churches, they don't teach on covenant, uh, let alone covenant character. And another thing is covenant identity. You know, identity is what you assimilate with and what you put yourself in. So how many of you are seated in Christ Jesus? Okay. So the heavenly place is not really some far off place. The heavenly place is you in Christ Jesus, wherever you're at. So when I pray for people, I always make them pick up their feet because I want them to understand that we're breaking things off of the earth. The earth is kind of messed up. Amen. So we want you to stay clean. All right. So tonight, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's a strange word, but maybe you'll learn something. Mark 16, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The shall is if they give permission, permission if they say, I receive that, then they can get healed. Uh, that's the biggest thing, okay? I want you guys to understand, you're not a failure if you pray for somebody and they don't get healed. It's left to the individual. Now, I had a man who was 102 years old, not very long ago, I prayed for him, 102 years old, and his family wanted him to receive prayer, and I went up to him, I said, hey, uncle, how are you? He's like, I like mock you already. I was like, you don't like me pray for you? He said, no, you can pray for me. Pray for me. But I like go already. I said, well, you better tell them because they don't like you. Go. And he was like, you know what? Stop praying. I like go. And within 48 hours, he passed. You know? Yeah, hallelujah. There was a man, they just did his one-year anniversary for his, uh, I guess he passed away a year ago. And they were doing a bike run thing. And, you know, when I went to the hospital, I went to pray for my uncle. My grandpa's brother was in ICU. And I went to ICU. I was looking for my uncle. And these people ran me down because I know them from school. And ICU, you know, is a kind of a, a, man, it's a place of a lot of trauma and different things. But I went there for one thing, and then these people saw me, and they said, hey, can you pray for, you know, our, our father and our husband? And so I walk in, and I see, I see this man stretched out, but I also see another man standing in the middle of him. Looks like the one inside, but younger. And he's telling me, tell him, stop praying. So I tell the family, he's standing right here. Do you guys see him? He wants, he wants you to stop praying because he wants to go. And they're like, they started laughing and crying at the same time. They said, that's exactly what he told us before. That if anything was to ever happen to him, don't pray, let him go. But, you know, everybody wants to sometimes pray their will over other people. And, you know, sometimes we believe that life on earth is far greater than life in heaven. Low, low. Anyway. You know, this guy is standing there, and he, he's telling me, tell him enough already. My body's not going to recover. So I tell him that, and they laugh, and they said, okay. So I said, just enjoy. He can hear you and everything. Just enjoy. Say your thing. And within four days, he passed away. So, oh, I mean, you know, it's up to the person. It's up to the individual. If you want to live, it's God's great pleasure to extend your life. If you want to go, it's God's great pleasure to receive you into his presence. Which is not very far off because you're already in his presence. Hallelujah. So that's what covenant character is. Character is who you are on the inside. Identity is who you are on the outside. You guys cool with that? All right. So, all right. That's all I have to say. Okay. Good night. Oh. <laughs> Sunday, you guys wish was that short. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it is hot on Sunday, bro. Man, when you see babies sweating, man, that just tells me that the Lord is on fire. I need to keep preaching. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. So, covenant. Covenant is a funny thing because covenant is what God cut with man. You know, and he had, to cut a, he had to cut a covenant with man. And guess why? Because he had separation with man. The only reason he had to cut a new deal was so that he could have some kind of agreement with man because how many know that after the fall of Adam and Eve, how many know that the mind kicked in and it became a real rotten place? So 99% of my ministry is trying to reset and recalibrate mindsets. If you sit in here for any length of time, you will hear about it, that you're not allowed to be moody. Hallelujah. One of the biggest Bible colleges in America is Moody Bible Institute. Some guys should go there. All right, let's flip the screen here and let's see. And you, you guys can all read along now. I pray that I'm not, man, if I'm a preacher that preaches only revelation to you and you get blown away by everything I say, then you're not spending enough, enough time with the Lord. Amen. 
Amen. All right. So read that. Okay, public school style. Everybody read at your own speed. Because that's what you're going to do anyway. I know. <laughs> All right, so as a Christian, you are what? To the covenant God made with? Okay, you guys cool with that so far? Okay, knowing how to operate within your covenant and being obedient to God's word positions you to? Experience victory in every area of your life. God is ever mindful of his? He's, he's mindful of it. As a result, he's got? So what does God want for you? Are you sure? So why are you always talking about your decrease then? I like decrease my waistline. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, if you got it, flaunt it. Uh, so as a believer, you're in covenant with God and you should always be mindful of that fact. So what is your deal with God? Same deal he left with Jesus, you know. After the redemption, you guys know that Jesus left it all to you. You are not just an heir, you're a joint heir. So that means you share in the hundred. You share in a hundred percent. The whole. You don't get a piece. When you get a piece, everybody wants to fight over it. And that's what a lot of churches want to talk about is, well, our church does this. This is what we believe. Shut up. If you're not doing the whole gospel, there's something wrong with you. I had one pastor tell me, well, our church, we specialize in evangelism. Okay, so what do you do after you evangelize them? Basically, you have a big nursery. Because they all get saved and they're all brand new Christians. They're babes in Christ, according to what Paul wrote. So you got a whole big church full of babies. And then what? And then what? You know that the majority of the ministry that we enjoy here is from people that don't even go to church here. You guys understand that? By the hundreds every week. Okay, so, you know, that's not even bragging. That's just, oh my God. Where's everybody else picking up the slack? Okay, so my pleasure is to get all of you healed and educated and revelated and get you to a place where you can lighten my load. So far it hasn't worked. Anyway, all right, next screen. Let's take a look. All right. Okay, read that. Genesis 15, right? So God promised to bless and multiply Abram. Okay, Abram was his real name before he became Abraham. Now, why did God have to do that? I'll tell you what. In Hawaii, what does ha mean? Bread. Closely meaning almost the same thing back then. How many know that when God created Adam, he breathed into Adam? Right? So how many know that when he breathed into Adam life, how many know that life was squandered somehow because of the fall? So when you get Abraham on the scene, he has to put a new breath in, a new covenant. But this covenant now has to be cut in blood. Now, understandably, a lot of people won't understand this. Even if you've you got friends that you want to explain this to, you, they, or you want to explain to them about covenant, they're going to look at you like, huh? Because they don't understand covenant. The best way I can explain it to you is when two men really love each other and they want to cut a deal between two families in peace and agreement, they will cut a part of themselves and then mix the blood together. That's blood brothers, right? So God does pretty much a, a similar thing. He cuts a blood deal with Abraham. How many you know that Abraham was very blessed? And all he did was he, he honored God with the first tenth of everything he had. So you want to continue a covenant? Hey, follow his lead. Amen. I'm not here to tell you to do anything. Basically, I'm just here to tell you that if you want to go to the next level in your life, then you got to start working on your finances with God. you got to start working on your mindset with God. And you also got to start working on your... You are what you speak, man. Whatever you're speaking is what you are. All right, so if you constantly say how pathetic you are, guess what we think of you? Potatoes. Uh. All right, so Genesis 15. Let's uh, go to the scripture if you can punch it in. I, I know it's like, you know. And then we'll come back to this one because that's the next set. Okay, because you got to see some stuff anyway, right? All right, I mean, you need proof. Uh, you need evidence. Okay, hang on. She'll get it in there. All right, so a couple of things, you know, that even as a young Christian that I learned was that as long as I didn't deviate from the program, 
I would stay blessed. Now, like I said earlier, there's the Mark 16. Everybody can do healing. That's part of your deal as a covenant child of God. But then there's a part in there where Paul talks about the gifts. You guys remember that? Now, gifts are another thing. There's a gift of healing. Now, if everybody had the gift of healing according to Mark 16, then how many know that Paul wouldn't have to write about the gift of healing? Everybody would have had it. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Then there's a gift of healing and deliverance. That in and of itself is a gift that comes in. It steps in where everything else has not worked. Now, I thank the Lord that he uses me in that sometimes. Uh, you know, praise the Lord. You know, a lot of people attribute, you know, healing and deliverance to what I do. Well, praise God. Wish you would translate into dollar signs. But anyway, someday, nah. It already is. You guys know. Eh? Look at my shoes. Oh, rip. Shut up. That's, that's the style. So if I rip your pants, that's the style. Okay, after these things, you guys see it? The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So he, what he's crying about is he doesn't have a son. All right. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. So we know that God's going to take a seed out of Abraham somehow and create a a family. Now, this is the same thing that God does later when he sends Jesus as a seed to, he wants to reap a harvest of a family. He sows a son. So he's, Abraham's crying about he has no son because that's his lineage. All right. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now, I mean, if you look at the stars, how many stars are out there? Hallelujah. Go climb the top of Mauna Kea. How many stars do you see? Wait, you banned right now. Stop it. Can I go right now? In verse 6, here's the requirement of anything that God tells you to do. What does it say in verse 6? And he believed. He believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Remember, there was no right standing with God because there was no blood sacrifice. So, I mean, you know that belief is one thing that will get you to understand your right standing with God. That is identity and character, right? Identity is because you're righteous, you are identified as a child of God. Am I right or am I wrong? Character proves to others that you are a child of God. Your behavior, in other words. All right. So how many of you behave badly at times? Oh, look at the honest people in here. Anyway. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of your, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, and we'll move on. Hang on. Hold on. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me what? A three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and a partridge in a pear tree. Wait, that's not... (laughs) But you see, we crossed over into this because there's a deal that's being brewed here. Well, you know that when God is brewing a deal with you, you guys know that three is the number of the Trinity, right? So it, it's a completion. Now, how I many you know you're the addition to the Trinity? Quadrinity, right? Probably. Now, a lot of people don't understand that He is not greater than you. He has included you in the Trinity. So if it's a quadrinity, how I many you know that you function as an extension of that position? The number one thing that is going to come against you all the days of your life is conditions. How many of you suffering from some kind of condition? Yeah. And I don't care what the human condition is that you say you have. How many of you know that position always overrides condition? All right. You think President Obama has problems? Sure. 99 problems. But anyway, but his position overrides most of his conditions. All right? So what is your condition? Oh, well, I'm sick. 
Well, your position overrides that. Because you've got to remember, you're so temporary on this earth anyway. I don't care what age you are. You could be one year old. You're still temporary. Life is very short. All right? So if we go back to our notes now, go back to your notes, and we can see. All right. Hang on. All right. Now read that. Because Abram question how he would receive the promise God entered into a uh, covenant with him and as you read from verse 9 he starts to tell them what he's got to do now to enforce this covenant now covenant is just a deal cut in blood so we know that God did this with Abraham and you are one of his descendants now so the same deal he cut with Abraham is exactly the same deal that you have it, there's no difference in fact uh, that is baseline that deal is base. Beyond that, how I many you know that he erased conditions? Now, back then, God was appeasing the condition because the enemy had, understandably, he had won the lease to the earth. Okay, you guys understand how that goes? Because remember now, God created the earth for who? For Adam and Eve. They squandered it and they lose it. So what happens is, man, how many of you hate your landlord? Anyway, all right. Because your landlord gives you, uh, when you move in, uh, conditions of the lease. I mean, you know that the enemy comes in now and he's very conditional. He takes the unconditional love of God and he puts conditions on it. He stamps it. And he has all these things that got to be done. And how I many you know that because of that, God got to come up with the law now through Moses. And how I many you know this thing is a big fat mess basically later on because people don't understand position. They only understand conditions. So the enemy has a set of conditions. Then God has to match that with another set of conditions. If you read Deuteronomy 28, the first 14 verses have to do with blessing. From 15 to 64 has to do with curses. Uh, stacked over because you know that God always, he always has trump cards that he beats the devil with. Yeah? Now for you, you know what the number one trump card is? We said it earlier. Your, your position. You've been bought and paid for by the blood, the blood of Jesus. You've been bought and paid for by that blood. So that has already elevated you into a place of being a royal priest of a house. Now the enemy is going to come and try and strip you of that identity. And he's going to put your character into question. Because he wants you to question your position. Uh, I don't know how else to tell you this, but get plenty of fools out there. You know, you know what I'm saying when I say fools? It's foolish teaching that isn't based in true word value. So if you read Ephesians 2, 6, he has put you in a position. Religion always tries to come and conditionalize everything to do with your position. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Even you younger ones in your teens, you guys got to know that one day you may be called to lead a family, a church, a company. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, everybody that follows you will be in jeopardy of confusion. That's all. They'll just be confused. All right. Are you confused? I'm here to tell you. If you're ever confused about what I teach, just remember Ephesians 2.6. six. You're seated where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, trump card. Amen. So if the enemy comes to engage you, all you got to say is, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Why? Because he's not allowed in your position. What he wants to do is engage you in a battle where you are the person that destroys yourself by taking yourself out of that position and making yourself a conditional person. That's why, have you ever noticed that prayers are always screwed up? God, when? God, why? God, how? God, if? God, maybe? <laughs> Preach to yourself. Say it. Shut up. You know why? Because you have all of those things. You don't have to ask God for anything. It's all declaration of independence. You're independent of the world and the enemy. But you are in Christ Jesus. So whatever you say goes. Yes. Amen? Um, several years back, you know, we had a boy that uh, came all the way from Seattle, Washington, came to Hawaii. Uh, his family's from Hawaii. Uh, he came to the church, a little bit cuckoo, cuckoo clock. <laughs> you know that kind? He would come to church, catatonic. Like, and then one night he decided, you know, everybody, here's the thing. 
If you're going to pray for somebody, make sure you know your position. Because if you don't know your position, all hell will break loose. And this boy, <laughs> God bless him, he started running around the church like a monkey. Running across the top of the furniture, running everywhere. I, church was done. It was a Wednesday night. It was done. I was in the back talking to some people. Then all of a sudden we are, ooh, ah, ha, ha, ee, ooh, ah, ha. started running all over the furniture. And several of our people, God bless them, praise God, a lot of them not here anymore, was chasing after him. Like, come here, come here. What are you doing? Get over here. Go. And I'm in the lobby of our church. We, we were across KTA in that little, little itty-bitty church. And I just peeked in the lobby and they're saying, Pastor Tim, oh, hallelujah. And I've been preaching about grace for a long time, position versus condition. I just went in there and said, hey, get over here. And he came walking. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't make me special. It's just I understand my position. My position overrides any condition. If he wants to be a monkey, my position dictates the terms and conditions of his behavior in the house of God. Same like you. If you kid acting up, what do you do as a parent or a big sibling? Hey, stop it over. Get over here. And they go, oh. Why? Because your position, right? It's up to you though, right? Everybody got to understand. Okay? Hallelujah, I'm getting tired. You guys all right? Uh, all right, next one. Click it. God cut a covenant to bless and exceedingly multiply Abram and his seed, Jesus Christ, and change Abram's name to Abraham. All right, next one. Keep going. God swore by himself to keep his oath. That's in Hebrews 6. Now, if we look at Hebrews 6, just so you can see, uh, how does God swear by himself? Well, he makes a deal with himself to come through. How well, you know that God cannot lie and God doesn't change his mind because he doesn't operate from the realms of his mind? Only people do. I've heard this before. People will say, well, God told me to do this and blah, 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 and then they start doing it and then it fails and then they say, well, God must have changed his mind. Um, well, uh, hallelujah. How about you screwed it up? And you you got to blame somebody else for screwing it up. Amen? All right. For when God made a promise to Abraham, Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. You guys like that? Well, you got to understand that. That's the way God operates. When he makes a deal, he doesn't change his mind. You know that the same deal he made with Abraham still sits on you today? Because we are all Abraham's seed. We all descended from him. So nothing changes. What, what's, the, what's the number one thing you got to do to ensure your covenant? I'll tell you, you may not like it, but it's called tithing and giving offerings. You may not like it, but here, here I am. I'm going to tell you this. I can't help you if you don't help yourself. God can't do nothing. He made a deal. And you know when he made this deal? Was after Abraham was already tithing without God telling him to. He did that on his own. So if you want to blame somebody for tithing, you blame Abraham. I'm, I'm for real. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, Abraham was doing that. He was given a tent. So he was doing it and God said, you know what? That's, that's a sign that you love me. Hallelujah. You want to get out of any trouble you're in? Start tithing. Sow your way out. And then don't tell me that, oh, well, I cannot. Well, then God cannot, I cannot, you cannot, whatever. You know, I'll keep praying for you. Uh, what else can we do? Some people, they, they feel really, but I don't want money. Eh, hey, brah. The rules of the game is a tenth of everything. It doesn't only have to be money. You still got to give time and energy and space and your attendance. And man. Let me ask you this. How many of you spend 2.4 hours a day in the presence of God? That's a tithe of your day. Wah, wah, wah. We all fail then if that's the case, right? 2.4 hours. What is 0.4? I don't know. What? 20, 20 minutes? 15 minutes? Something, something, turn it, I don't know. I don't want mathematician. I told you I hate math. All right? So, you may not like that, but how many know that, hey, you want to stay in that place? You got to do what you got to do. 
out of every hundred dollars you got ten and then he promises to make the 90 go way further than the hundred i don't know i like those odds amen especially if he's going to stack it a hundred fold three levels of church out of court 30 fold inner court 60 fold holy of holies that's you because that's what we teach we we've gained the position amen hundred fold what is the deal? You give 10%, you get 100 fold. Well, you, you don't like those, those, those returns on investment? Then something is wrong with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love giving to God. You know what? Many of you have sowed into my ministry and I'm going to the mainland. You know what I do with a lot of those seeds? I plant it for you in the name of you over there so that you get a return of in, on investment there. Wherever I go, I try and give. Uh, you know that this last trip to Honolulu, we actually lost money on this. But the reason that we went wasn't to make money, but it went because it changes lives. Amen? So eventually, you know, these things got to pay for itself. Otherwise, I might as well go back groceries at Safeway. You guys can laugh anyway. Right. So these things have to pay for themselves. Going to Texas, you know, we front out a lot of money. Thanks to a lot of you, we're able to pay for that trip in advance. And we go there, um, we take some seed and we plant it. And we, the return on investment is you have family in Texas now. Amen. Amen. Blood family. Yes. Right. No matter where I go. Many of you in here, you have family in Puerto Rico. True. And not by the kind. No. Many of you, you got to understand, you have family in the Dominican Republic. You have... I have sold it into pastors in Africa, the Philippines, India, all over the South America and Central America. All of you right here, you have family out there that we have taken some of your seed and sent it to them. Because the dollar goes a lot further there than it does here. Like we can sit on money and be fat cats, but what is that going to do? You got to send your money away from yourself. That's why it's called, that's why it's called seed. You put it into another place so that it grows a harvest and it shows it shows up for you so don't fret if some of you like oh my god oh, rah, rah, rah. Bah, just change the odds of the game you got to stack it in your favor anyway okay now go back to the notes all right you guys can study all of this later amen so god makes a covenant with abraham swearing by himself so when god says oh my god he doesn't say that he says oh myself Okay, why? Because it's himself. There's nobody higher than God. It's him. All right, so God swore by himself to keep his oath. Now, how do you know that God doesn't change? No, he doesn't. Why? Because it says in Hebrews, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, not tomorrow. Don't put time limit on God, okay? He's the same. Now, read that. Read that line. Go ahead. Words are... The most sacred part of any covenant is words because you got to understand your deal. Your deal is your deal. Nothing changes it. So you speak from the access point of you have already received. So if you're talking about loss or decrease, I mean, you know that that's not God's language. He's talking about increase and he's always talking about how prosperous you are, not how lacking you are. Do you believe that you are blessed? Let me ask you that. How many believe that you are blessed? Even if you don't feel blessed because feeling blessed is something that happens between your ears. Being blessed, you go back to the word, which is Ephesians 1. says he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So how many blessings do you have? Every blessing. Is everything a spiritual blessing? Let me ask you this. When you had an abundance of money, didn't you feel ultra spiritual? All of a sudden, you're like, thank you, God. And then after you squander it all, God, why? God, how come? All the conditions come in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we all get a lot of that. Lolo. All right. Next one. Read that. Go ahead. Allow to anchor your soul. Hebrews 6 19. All right. In fact, most of you should be carrying a Bible. You can go look that up. All right. Hallelujah. Do we have that? Do you have it ready? All right, maybe you can take a look. Hang on. Hebrews 6, 19, because I know if I let you go from here, you're going to be like, I am Bombay. <laughs> Hang on. All right. 
All right, read that. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind. Huh. Hallelujah. You guys know what that means? Behind the veil? The veil that was ripped in half at the death of Jesus? How many know that you now have an access point? You can walk out anytime you want, but why would you? Do you believe that there's a higher place than being seated in the heavenly place with Christ Jesus? I don't think there's a higher position than that. So that's the anchor of your soul. You know what your soul is? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if your soul likes to pull you out of your position, how I many you know that you need to anchor your soul at the seated place next to God himself in Christ Jesus? All right? Behind the veil. How I many you know that behind the veil just means that you're not in a high position. You're just behind the veil. You're in that place. Now, the veil was ripped in half, so you ain't hiding. You see, you seated there. How many of you know that every one of your Christian friends that go to other churches or whatever is supposed to see how blessed you are? So drive that new car without apology. Spend your money. Enjoy your money. Some of you are like, oh, I don't want money. Well, you're not growing money then. Because if you don't seed money, you cannot grow money and you can't show it. Oh my God. How many of you would love to give everybody $100 bills anytime you want? Of course. You would, wouldn't you? Why? Because you would know that there's no end to it once you give one. You, you got to start thinking along those lines. This is what I tell people all the time. And I just told this to somebody on a while. They'll say, oh, can you pray for me that I would, I would be blessed because my money is always cursed. I said, give me your money. Uh-huh. You see, you're cursed. That's why you're cursed because you get a hard time to let go of your money. And they go, oh, oh, I never mean them that way. I just meant that I only get a couple dollars in my wallet. So why would you get so hung up on a couple dollars? Simple. Because you're not able to let go. God cannot let go. Because where are you seated again? In do you know that when you give, you are operating as God? Amen. And you don't think, you got to understand the word. It says every word that proceeds forth from God's mouth always returns to him. And it, doesn't, it never returns void. So that means if the word goes out and brings a harvest, how many of you know that when your hand goes out, it brings a harvest? You see, if you're having a problem with money, it's because you have a problem giving it away. I don't care what... How many of you ever lost money? Somebody ripped you off. Tell the truth. Okay, they ripped you off. No, they didn't. It was an opportunity for you to bless them. They just didn't return it. So you have a right now to place a hundredfold return on investment by calling it an offering instead of calling it a theft. Amen. I, I see people all the time. They're like, hey, you gave me the wrong change. You give me the wrong change. You give me the wrong change. Three cents off. Trees, what is three cents going to do for you? You can't even put them in a pocket meter anymore. You can't even make a call. You can't even throw them on the wall and gamble at school. All the old timers know that. <laughs> Filipinos. Anyway. You see, if you have a problem receiving money, it's because you have a problem giving away money. Amen. So don't ever look at that as a loss ever again because you are so prosperous, no matter what goes out of you, has to come back as a harvest. That's the way God operates. He gave a son, he got a, he got a family. Not all of them is right standing in their brains. They are in righteousness and in right standing with God, but their minds are far. Amen. So how many of you are going to change that now? You don't ever get hung up on money because money is just coins and paper. You know what? If I was giving you, yeah, you like this paper, yeah, you know, what would you do? Oh, okay. Money is just paper with numbers on them. Most of us are very good at giving it away to stuff, but not people. You ever notice that? Oh, if somebody get one deal for you, oh, bro, yeah, I like that deal. Because you're going to get something in return, but you forget there's something far greater that comes in the spirit. It's called prosperity. Prosperity, if you're taking notes tonight, write this down. Prosperity is this. Nothing missing and nothing broken. 
I'll tell you right now, if you can understand that word prosperity, nothing missing, nothing broken. The rest of your life, nothing missing, nothing broken. You know what that means as well? You will never suffer Alzheimer's. Because nothing will be ever missing and nothing will ever be broken in your mind. I know that that's a big thing nowadays. People are very fearful of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, it's, that's number one. You know, they're also fearful of cancer. How I many you know that cancer can disappear anytime, any way you believe it will disappear? You gotta see it. You gotta speak to that cancer, and you gotta say, "Disappear in Jesus' name." And you gotta have a seed that matches. That's why we always call it seed and need. Because if you have a need, you see it towards your need, and the need is already answered as soon as you put it in your hand. Why? Well, see, stand up. I'll show you guys something. In the order of Melchizedek, you guys see this last line. Here, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. If Marcy was to take my hand, how many you know that that's an exchange of anointing? Now, if Marcy was to put something in my hand, okay, watch this picture now. She put something in my hand. This is my hand as the high priest. At the same exact moment, you don't have to wait for it. She puts it in, the blessing comes upon at the same moment. So if you have a need in any area of your life, it can be fixed with a seed. Whether you like it or not. Some people would say, well, you just like our money. Of course I do. I love money. But if I love it too much, it's the root of all kinds of evil. But here's the thing, right? If you don't fall in love with money, money has to chase you down. To get attention from you. You see, whatever you don't pay attention to will always try and gain your affection. Does that make sense to you? If you ignore a child, he's going to do everything in his power to get your attention. To the point of climbing on top of you to try and climb inside of you. Am I right or am I wrong? So money is exactly the same way. Right? (laughs) Have no fear. Jesus is near. Amen? If you don't pay money any attention, you just say, you know what? Money always comes. This is what I tell people. Easy come, always come. Not easy come, easy go. So you got to change your mindset. Easy come, always come. Why? Because it always comes and it comes easy. You know why? You don't pay attention to money. You don't pay attention to loss because you only pay attention to prosperity. If you pay attention to prosperity, how many you know that the devil has just lost the game of life with you? He cannot compete on those terms because he's so used to getting your attention. Amen. So here's what I tell a lot of people. As you start this journey in Christ, there's going to be a barrage of attacks sent your way. And the the barrage is going to come because the enemy wants to get your attention where he once had it. He's going to try and push Jesus out of the way. Look at me, look at me. And then the tendency is for a lot of churches to address the devil as an adversary, as an opponent, as a competitor. All you got to do is say, no, my position eliminates him. He can't come into my position. Why? Because the blood has cut him off. But if you take your mindset and put it below the bloodline, oh gosh, now you got problems. Everything is missing and everything is broken. You guys catching my drift tonight? I want you guys to be successful. Uh, Amen? But you got to want it too. Whatever you are craving, I mean, you know that it's going to try and elude you. If you crave money, it's going to elude you. It's going to play chase master with you. You know when kids, you see them on the playground, catch me, catch me, catch me, tag I was like, you sucker. Why? Because it tries to get your attention, so you chase it down. So money is like that. Let me tell you something. You cannot respect money to the point where it overrides your love for God. You know why? Because when you get to heaven, I got news for you guys. There's no amount of money can buy you God's attention anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. How can the streets be paved with gold and you're going to tell God that you need money? You know, if God was to sneeze in a heavenly place, just the gold dust alone would make you a billionaire. God not allergic. Good. So the covenant made Abraham rich, right? 
Now, you guys are going to see that as we come down on these notes. Let's go back to the notes again. The high priest. So you guys saw the exchange value, right? I want you to understand that because as soon as you put it in the treasure chest, the blessing already chased you down. The manifestation, we, we say 7 to 21 days, it shows up. But you've got to understand, it has to show up. Unless you're running away from it. Hello, Lolo. You've got to stay in a position of reception. All right? So, oh, everything in the kingdom is done through Jesus. All right, you read all of that. You guys good? First one first. God established a covenant between himself, Abraham, and and what are you in that schematic? Seed. You're a seed. So do you have that same covenant with Abraham? Yeah. Okay. Through Christ Jesus, you are part of that covenant. That's in Galatians 3, 16 and 29. Everything in the kingdom is done through Jesus. And where are you seated? So is that a hard thing to accomplish? No, because if it's done through Jesus, I mean, it goes through Jesus, it passes through you. Circum circumcision of the heart is a sign of the covenant. Circumcision in the heart is that you have cut away the fleshy part of worldly behavior and you have put on the righteous, the righteous covenant of God. You, you are in right standing, therefore you are entitled to the blessing of Abraham and beyond. Amen? All right, next one. Let's read through these so you get all of it tonight. Read that. The covenant... Why did it make him rich? Because <laughs> he wasn't afraid of loss. All right? Hallelujah. So he gave away a tenth, the, the best of his best. Amen. Now, you guys know that the reason that Abraham had to do this was so that the high priest had sacrifice. He could do sacrifice on behalf of man because there always has to be shed blood to cover over things. The good part about Jesus is his blood doesn't cover over, it eliminates. So you are a part of the covenant because of the shed blood of Jesus. You don't have to go out and look for covenant. You already have it as part of the deal. All right, keep going. He was rich in cattle, silver, and gold. So not only was he rich in cattle, but he had money, he had resources. How many, how many of you could use a few extra bucks? Yeah, you, can, you have a right to all of it, amen? Not just cattle. Cattle just represents meat in your house. Okay, I don't think you want your yard full of cattle. Not unless you have a ranch, amen? How many of you would rather have the money in place of the cattle? Okay. All right, next one. Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, was rich because he was... Just by hanging out with his uncle, knowing how he operated. How I mean, you know that... He mimicked the behavior of his uncle. So what did that do for him? Made him rich too. Wow. You guys understand a lot? He came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, a very evil place. How many of you came out of Waimanalo? Anyway, or Lanakila, or Nanavale, or Pipik. Okay, why, why you lie? I mean, eh. right. read that. You are also rich because you are part of the same covenant. Amen. You guys learning something? Yeah. So are you rich? Yeah. So you got to eliminate the greed part. Hmm? You got to eliminate the loss part. You got to eliminate the fear part. All right. Next one. Covenant people obey God in detail. All right. Our church is supposed to lay out the details for you and not leave it to hope. Okay. I'll just be honest with you. If I leave you hoping that you're going to get something, how many of you know that I have failed in my capacity as a teacher of the Word of God? I got to leave you with a firm, resolute conviction that you will be okay when you leave here. How many of you get that when you come here? You know how you know you get that? Because you know bottom me after you leave. Yeah? You know the ones that have the whole part? They always call. They always, they always check. They always text. They always request. They always... The thing is, I'm okay with that, except that at some point in time, you got to learn to walk yourself. I'm happy to walk you for a while, but after a while, you become a nuisance as a 50-year-old baby. i got to walk around. And at some point in time, you got to learn to take the pampas off and put panty and BBDs. 
All right, and you got to walk your walk, amen? You got to stand on your own two feet and say, okay, he's giving me instruction based in the word. I do that, automatic blessing. How many of you are getting that automatic blessing? I got news for you. You're already blessed. Now you got to get the autopilot going, amen? The hardest time a plane suffers is when it's taking off and landing because there's a lot of stress. But when it's on autopilot, it's supposed to be the easiest part of the flight, right? Read that. Worship. Okay, let's talk about worship. How many different ways can you worship the Lord? Some people say singing. Very good. Many of you don't do that. <laughs> I know some people that come to this church and say, Well, I don't like everybody watching me. Nobody's supposed to be watching you. You also to close your eyes and sing to the Lord. This is unto the Lord. Right? Oh, hallelujah. Unless you can do a better job. Shut up. Just close your eyes and sing along. Amen. How hard is that to do? Hard if you shame. Very hard if you're fearful that people are watching you. I was trained that you worship the Lord. Now, singing is just your voice. I mean, you know, there has to have an attitude of worship from the inside. I mean, you know that you can get healed through singing to the Lord. Why? Because you address the Lord. God doesn't dangle things. Amen. When he gives you something, he gives it to you forever beyond your existence. You know that you sitting in this church tonight, believe it or not, is going to bless your descendants to the 40th generation. Everybody gets blessed. Oh, but pastor... They don't come church with me. Who cares? It's your family tree. It is. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All I know is that a tree is one unit. Right? I mean, you know, we all belong to the same tree as Abraham. Yeah, that's why, you know, several sermons ago, flakes, fruits, and nuts. <laughs> yeah. The body of Christ has a lot of flakes, a lot of fruits, and a lot of nuts in it. Oh, man. If I had chocolate, we'd be all right. Right, ladies? Next one. Abraham dared to obey God with the covenant on his mind. How many of you know that you got you to gotta dare to obey God? If God tells you, hey, you see that guy over there? Go give him $10. Hallelujah, it's my $10. I'm glad you said that. That's your last 10 for me, said the Lord. No, it's not. Man. People always do that, right? They always say, oh, I don't know if that's God. I don't know. I had people before call me, Pastor, I stay at Long's Drugs. I see this lady with one mumu leg. I feel like the Lord telling me for prefer what you think. Oh, no. oh, Lord. <laughs> you actually call me for that. Oh, well, let's look at the negatives. What if you don't pray for her? I can tell you right now, her leg not going to change. She not going to know the goodness of God. What, what would change for you if you did and you dared to obey? What would happen to you? The worst possible thing that could happen, if you obey God and pray for somebody and their leg is all boss and nothing happens is you got to practice. Maybe she won't receive. Maybe the Lord is just using you to go over there and see if you're obedient. I remember one time, I was in, uh, man, where was I this time? I was, okay, I was at this place, and I, I was walking down this hallway of this building, and there was a person, and he looked disheveled, sitting there, all boss. You guys know what is all boss? We live in Hawaii, yeah? He was all boss up. Looked like he was boss drunk too, a little bit. And the Lord says, I want you to give him $5. I was like, okay, praise Jesus. I have $5 right now. My only $5. And you know, I was thinking to myself, $5, $5, $5. Anyway. Well, Jared got busted to the... Anyway, $5. I was thinking, okay, if with 5 bucks, I can get uh, 5 double cheeseburgers. I can get 3 double cheeseburgers and 2 McChickens. I can get... And the Lord says, give my last $5 to that person. I was like, say what? 
For real? <laughs> what? I said, oh, so I, yeah, I'm human. Like, rack a rack a rack a rack a mother, father, rack. So I pull out five bucks and I said, hey, man, here you go. And he looked at me like, God bless you. I was like, you know what I'm thinking? He better. This is my last four hours. You're going to eat more than me. <laughs> yeah, my five bucks. So I went and I walked past this guy. He's sitting in a, it's a building, offices. I walk, he's sitting with his legs he pulls his legs back, and I pass by. All right, bro, thanks. Hey, I feel blessed. You be blessed, too. He says, amen. So I, I kept walking, and I turned around to say, have a good. Sucker will disappear. Um, there was only one door in and out. As soon as I walked past him, and I went to say, hey, have a. I had a WTF moment. No, see, you know what a WTF is. Okay, I never hear him. Now, this is split seconds. This is not minutes. This is, this is just... Son of Masushi, where you went? He was gone. 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 Chicken skin, duck skin, whatever you like. I was like, oh my goodness. And I, confused as anything, I went and did my thing, came on. I was still confused. Went in my car. I said, okay, now what? Now I got to go scrape one dollar together, forget one McDouble, one double cheeseburger. So I pull open in these cars. You guys remember such a thing as an ashtray? You guys remember these days when a car had an ashtray and usually had ashes inside? I pull open an ashtray because now what car has ashtrays? No more. No more such animal. You remember you used to have cigarette lighter? Yeah. No more. I pull open an ashtray and I find $300 in my ashtray. And I'm like, mm, No. Cannot be. Close the ashtray. <laughs> Pull up in the ashtray. Three hundred dollars sitting there, and I'm like, "There is no way I was so broke at this time in my life. There is no way I would misplace three hundred dollars. No way. This is my car. I had bought it from when I was brand new. I wasn't a guy that going stash money for a rainy day because he'll rain every day because you got to use the stash every day." And I'm looking at this $300. I'm like, okay. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it Three hundred bucks for five dollars, yeah. And I never saw this person ever again in my whole life. I was like, "What?" I was like, "I like those deals." So after that, I started looking to sow seed into people. Amen. You know, God has been very faithful in those areas. 
So no hit me up for money. Let God tell me first. You should never go out of your way to just give. You should be spurred by the Holy Ghost that reveals to you, yes, you know, and this. And you do that and you get blessed. You know, many of you are in this church because you're learning how to be generous because you was tight before. <laughs> and you know what? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I always go through the freezers. I always look what people give away. Okay, yeah, turkey link sausage. Yeah, they don't like eat this at home. That's how they brought them here. Anyway, <laughs> give something that you like to eat. Amen. Hallelujah. So God is good. Amen. Nah, kind. All right. Read that. Abraham obeyed. And God told him to sacrifice his only son because he knew God was faithful to his covenant. Now, you guys remember Isaac, his son? Yeah, yeah. You know, they say that Isaac was between 18 and 21 years old. Yeah. How do you get an 18 to 21 year old to say, yeah, dad, let's go up the mountain so you can stab me in the neck? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a little boy. Like, you guys see these pictures. Like, hey, this is a man now who's. You guys remember the whole story? Abraham and Isaac with the servants to get to the foot of the mountain. And the servants ask, Shall we go? Shall we ascend with you? And Abraham says the most classic line in the whole Bible. The lad and I will go. You stay here with the ass. Go read it in the King James. It's, so I got news for you. Some of you need to tie your ass to a tree. Because you got a lot of asses in your life that are telling you to go another way. Then you should be going. That's true. Hey, you, think I, you think I'm being crude? That's King James, man. Some of you are going to have to tie your ass to the tree and leave it with the slave mentality. That's what I'm really driving at. Because there's, there's people that are not looking out for your best interest. You go what, church? You better tie that ass to a tree. Amen? And yeah, the slave mentality. Don't run with the crowd. Last time I checked, all of you in here are here because you're rebellious people by nature. Yes. Tell the truth. When somebody tell you, no do that, you do them just for check. Yes. Uh, security check. I'm going to check in case you check. No touch the fire. He hot. <laughs> he is going to check. Yeah, you're going to check. That's all it is, right? No eat that. It's spicy. Oh yeah, baga hot. Yeah, then that's the kind of people we have in this ministry. So, I dare you to stay in this church for a long time. You know why? Because you're in a place of grace. You know, yeah, there's a lot of your slave mentality people. They don't want to be in a place of grace. They want to have a reason. They want to have a, something to blame for bad behavior. That's why I say, when you behave badly, just own it. You know, how many of you think evil things sometimes about people? And it involves guns, knives, assault, deadly weapons, running them over with cars, duct tape and rope, matches, lighter fluid, something like that. Well, that's, you know, I'm not going to say that's normal behavior because it's not. But we have these tendencies at times. You know, I was going from Waikiki in front of Ala Moana, on the Ala Moana Boulevard, before you hit Nimitz, right in front of Ala Moana, there was one lane open because construction is going on. And two sides. I don't know what brainiac thought this up. Yeah, let's do construction in the middle of the day on the left lane and the right lane at the same time. And everybody got to squeeze into the one lane. It took me literally 30 minutes to go from here probably to Ken's House of Pancake. Okay. And then I come back to Hilo and I see people just driving like, I don't know, crackers. You know, kind of like out of your mind kind of driving. Like no even makes sense. I saw a guy today, I was following him. He put the right turn signal on and he went in the left lane. He's trying to fool me somehow. <laughs> 
as lucky I was on Oahu because they drive like that automatic without signal. They just... <laughs> yeah. And I'm this kind of guy. If you know wave. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. How many of you like that? You get rejection issues. If you let somebody go and then a wave, they just look at you. Oh, I was supposed to let you go or something. <laughs> Rejection 101. That's, that's us guys in here. Rebellious. You know what? We're generous. Just no tassel. There you go. <laughs> Amen. You guys know what I'm talking about. All right. Why are you here in this church? Because you dare to be different. And you are different. If they called you the black sheep of your family, it's because you was the black sheep of your family. Well, <laughs> I know my dad always told me, dreams are free. That was my dad's most famous line. I used to tell him, oh, dad, I get this idea. I'm going to do this thing like, dreams are free. And you know what I used to say to myself? Stupid howly. I used to think it, not say it, because I didn't want to get like, I didn't want to find out what the rug felt like going across my face as I got thrown. But I used to always be that kind of person. I used to dare to be different. My report card, every single teacher says, has shown great potential, but tends to be lazy. <laughs> How many of your report cards is let out? Yeah. Great potential. Well, welcome to the place of great potential. Now you're in the right place. Because everybody else is doing what they told. We do what we're told, but from a different source. Amen. And a child shall lead them. Because in my mind, I'm a big kid. Amen. You know why? I always look for the escape route first. I am not, I'm not the kind of guy that conforms. You go look in my Facebook Profile pictures way back. There was everybody was saluting Hitler, and then there's one guy like this in the crowd. I said, "That's me." Go <laughs> look. There's a picture like that. Yeah. Why? Because I don't conform to that. Because I, I always read things and go, "There must be a better way." And there always is. You find it, but you got to be looking for it. Amen. How many of you are always looking for a good deal? Come on, tell the truth. How many of you are a deal hunter when you go? You go to the discount place called Ross and you still look for a clearance. <laughs> you guys cheap. Ah. <laughs> God chose Abraham because he knew Abraham would obey him and teach the covenant to his son Isaac. So he got Isaac to go lie down. Okay, dad. Okay. This is only going to feel like a prick. Ready to stab his son. No worries, son. Going to be all right. Okay, dad. Stab me right in the heart. And then the angel stops him. And God saw something. That if this man would send his son to be sacrificed, then God could send his son later to be sacrificed. Do you guys see? There's always a type and shadow in the Old Testament that reveals itself in the New and that's where you're at. Amen. How many of you are getting revelated in this church? Good for you. Go tell your friends and watch them go, not. Good. Leave them alone. Next. Isaac also had faith in God's covenant. And it's proven through the word. Okay, keep going. Next. Abraham demonstrated his faith saying God would provide himself a lamb. Because, how I many you know, the angels stopped them. They needed a sacrifice. And what did they find in the thicket? Yeah, it's like a ram, yeah. Next. Abraham had, Abraham had a prophetic vision about Jesus being the sacrifice. And you can read about it there if you're writing it down. John eight fifty six and Hebrews eleven thirteen. All right, next. Abraham walked in obedience until the end, which proved he feared God. Now, how many of you know that you don't have to fear God anymore? Right? Some people say, oh, we have to fear God. God is not Thor. Trying to play whack-a-mole with his golden hammer on your head. That's what a lot of Christians view of God is. Oh, I love you, God. Please don't kill me early. 
God will kill you if you try and wake him from his nap. All right, next. Because of Abraham's obedience, God stopped him from sacrificing his son Isaac and allowed his son Jesus to be sacrificed instead. You guys see now? Good, next. Jesus became the lamb God provided. Amen. All right. In the Old Testament, they found a ram in the thicket. He was caught by his horns in the bush. All right. All right, next. I could go a whole lot with that. Covenant people have to be willing to do what the other person asks and, uh, and take it to the next level. So if God is asking you to do something, you don't say, oh, how come? You just say, I'm going to do more than you're asking me. Because God not, not only provides you John 10.10, 10, He came to give you life and life more abundantly. Well, how many of you know that you enjoy the fruit of Jesus' labor? You don't have to suffer in this life. A lot of people say, well, must be that I got to suffer. Huh? Oh, boy. Some people truly believe that, that they're here to suffer. Covenant people know how to connect with the promises of God. Keep going. Next. Faith in your covenant connects you to the promise. Next. People who know and understand how to operate in the covenant will experience victory in Aaron. This is otherwise known as prosperity. Okay. How many of you are starting to enjoy prosperity? Now, you're getting older. There will be aches and pains, but you got to do something different. Amen? Right? Just drink diet, Dr. Pepper, instead of... Next. All right. Covenant people read the promises in the Bible knowing God is under covenant obligation to keep His word. Next. Confidence is a characteristic of covenant people. Why is confidence important? Simple. Because you don't fear. You give because you know that it's going to come back. You're going to get. No matter what you give, it's going to come back as a harvest. So you give everybody rash. You're going to be scratching. All right. Nobody like rash in abundance, right? So bring peace. You are the balm of Gilead. You soothe all the rash. You don't give people rash. That's the Old Testament. Okay, next. Some of you looking at me like I'm confused. Now these covenant people have confidence that God will do what he said. What did God promise you as a Christian? If you don't know, then you never ask. God, what do you want to do with my life? I want you to be a sacrifice. I'm going to kill you. Well, nice knowing you, Lord. Take care. He would never do that to you. He did that already. Yeah. So, you know, in the Philippines, every year, Easter time, you see one Filipino getting nailed to the cross. What a monumental waste of time. Emphasis on the mental. Why would you let somebody nail you to a cross so you can pretend like you, Jesus? Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Next. Okay, covenant people stand on the promises of God without wavering. So if you don't know what the promises are, they're on the back table. Next. All right, covenant people believe they are exceedingly fruitful. That means you operate from a, like a standpoint of uh, overabundance. You give from your own resources. Amen? How many of you are rich? Raise your hand because you are. You just haven't accessed it. How many of you are rich? How many of you know that there is money stored out there for you? Some people say, oh, Hilo. It's not one rich place. Um, yeah, anyway. If you took everybody's bank account in Hilo... When I was, I was the president of the Hawaii Island Food Bank at the time, this is what we found through study, that Hawaii and Hilo people in particular had the highest per capita income or bank accounts in the nation was people from Hilo until Walmart opened. <laughs> Hilo people had the biggest savings accounts in the nation. So you know what that means? They scared they gonna lose them someplace. That's why they put them away. Hallelujah. I know one man, he had a coffee can full of money. He died and all his money is in a coffee can because he didn't trust the banks. And you know what his kids said when they found all the coffee cans? Happy days are here again. 
my father was tied, now he is light. Anyway, he's gone. They all say, okay, everybody. They're like, I'll grab a coffee again. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Good stuff. Next. Covenant people won't allow negative words to distract them from what God has promised. So you know that there's a lot of negative Christians out there. And most of you are known by them. They want to stop you at all costs. Why do your Christian friends want to stop you? Because they want you to be the crab that they pull from the top of the bucket that's about to escape and run back into the bayfront. They want you back in the bucket on the bottom. <laughs> I had a friend one time, he told me, hey, you making a party? I said, yeah. He, I told him, I need an armor. He said, you like the white one or the black one? I go, what is the white one? He go, the one that's hard for catch. Must be because I don't see them too much. He said, but get one certain way, you got to catch them. I was like, how you catch them? He go, if I tell you the certain way, then it's not a certain way. I said, shut up and bring them then. So he brought me, he brought me a cooler full of white uh-uh, my crab. It's from Bayfront. I was like, where you got this from? The ocean. Shut up. Anyway. But he said, there's a certain way. Then I was, you know, I was, I was working in a produce department at Mall Foods way back in the day, about only a couple years ago. And then I was, I was talking to this old man, and he came up to me. He said, hey, you get onion bag. I said, what the onion bag for? He goes, catch crab. I said, how you catch crab with an onion bag? He goes, because you're going to give me the onion bag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, I give you the onion bag. He said, I bring you crab. I said, I don't eat crab. He goes, well, give them to somebody who eat crab. So he said, oh, I put all the slop stuff inside. And he took it, he tied the bag, threw it in the ocean. Then the next day he came back. He said, crabs are really greedy trying to reach inside the bag and their legs all get stuck and he just pulled the bag in. So I gave you a secret to getting crab. <laughs> Catch for me so I can sell them because I don't eat crab. I never could see the point in eating crab when a thing tastes more rotten on the bottom. Anyway, you guys, uh, you guys know my theory on eggs, boiled eggs. So... Hmm. Well, how many of you like crab? Yeah. I don't know. It's just something about it that I just never, whatever. I mean, some of you think I'm mental. You know what is funny? Every time somebody eats crab in my presence, this is what they do. Can you pray for me? Getting itchy. Mm, eat all the crab. Keep eating them. Anyway. No, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going to wait till you almost pop breed. <laughs> How many of you really love that kind of stuff? Yeah. Crap. I don't know. And I was born, you see, I was born in Baltimore, which is famous for blue crab. Yeah. You can keep them for all I care. <laughs> sweet. What is sweet? Mm. It's like these people, they were telling me, hey, you ever ate durian? Oh, what is durian? They go, it's the one that tastes like heaven but smells like hell. <laughs> okay, I can't get that past my mind, but they were saying that, you know, evidently there's a fruit in Hawaii called durian. Because yeah. Filipinos eat anything, am I right? <laughs> Filipinos will eat anything. <laughs> That's the ones that look like this. Anyway, brother, brother, calm down. When I used to work meat department, they would tell us, oh, I can have all the guts. Why do you like the guts for? I'm going to cook them. And you know what this Filipino guy did one time? We'd, pigs come in sometimes, and we got to go clean out the inside. And he said, I like all that. That's the good stuff. And he went and he poked it, and he said, yeah, this is the good one. You foul devil. Get out in Jesus' name. Anyway, I heard that sometimes they cut the goat, right? And they pour it over hot rice. And 
You gotta be out of a tree of some sort or hanging by your tail from a tree if you're gonna eat that. And they call themselves blessed. I don't know. Man, well, praise the Lord. Whatever you think is negative, somebody thinks is positive. Yeah. How many of you like pork ribs? Yeah. You know that that was the stuff that the rich people never liked. So the poor people made ribs, and now the ribs cost more than the meat. Mm -hmm. Go figure. I don't understand. Pig feet. I mean, like pig feet. Yeah. Poor thing, the pig. He's walking around on his elbows now. <laughs> oh, walking around. These guys don't let me even get one break in this life. <laughs> oh, boy. Putting years. I know the one thing that my grandpa used to like pig eel. And he used to have them in his pocket and he used to cut pig and chew them like gum. My grandpa, what is that? You know, like this one. <laughs> we go to the parties and my grandpa would say, This one over here, you know, eat this one over here, okay? What is that, grandpa? You just don't eat that one. Roof, 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 roof. He made the sound of that. He thought, this one over here, you know, eat that one either. Meow, meow. Thought, what? Filipinos eat cats too. What? I thought only the Chinese. Anyway. Evidently, you cook whatever you can find. And why the dog got to be black for? Anyway. Take the skin off, same color. All right. Next. <laughs> See, you learn a lot in here. Useless information. All right. Through Jesus, you're part of the Abrahamic covenant. That's in Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. You guys know Ephesians 2, 6. Let's go right below that. Christ is your... So you're connected to the covenant. You're not a far, a far away from it. You're right in it. Next. Without Christ, you have no covenant. Keep going. The covenant is the basis by which you can trust God. How many of you trust God? Good. What is the next one? Trust means to rely and lean on and have great confidence in. All right. That's good. Um, keep going. When you trust God, it comes out of your spirit and into your soul. So that's why we say you speak and it enters your mind. It, you're not conformed to this world anymore. You're transformed and renewing. You got to keep speaking the word though so you, your brain catches up well, some of you know that your brain is way behind on some stuff. And some of your brains is twice as far behind as some other people. Nah, they just go to that church. Okay. The house of Israel, the house of Aaron, and everyone who fears the Lord are in covenant with him. And that's us. We, you know, we're cool. Yeah. Uh, your covenant, it guarantees victory. So you can never lose. Right? How many of you are starting to find that out? As long as you keep a clear mind, yes. right? your greatest enemy is? Well, your mind is a good thing. It's bad thinking based on traditions that makes you. You know that more Christians these days believe in a doctor's more than they believe in God? You know? Yeah, hallelujah. You know, in the old west, if you had a bullet hole, they would rub salt in it. And so the sink, uh, rubbing salt into the wound because it burned. And the, the idea behind the burning is it would constrict and it would cauterize the, the wound and seal it early and keep infection away. Yeah. So what would the doctor say when he was the one doing them? Yeah, a little frontier medicine. Anyone? No? Yeah. You know, in World War, well, it wasn't World War. It was a civil war, right? People would get bullets through their leg. Their leg get infected. They cut your leg off with a saw right in front of you with no anesthesia. What do you do at that point? Bite on your clothes. Yeah. But now, if the doctor says, oh, I'm going to do surgery on you, and I'm going to put you under anesthesia, and then you're going to sleep right through it. And then, yeah, which one is better? Well... You know that anesthesia is one of the portals that the demonic realm likes to use. Because you let your will down, you put your will down, 
and then they have the right to come and enter. So a lot of you that went through surgery in the past, you went under anesthesia. If you didn't cover yourself in the blood before you went in, you were subject to a process of demonic spirits coming to check if you had room for them, yeah. trying to check into your hotel. That's true. Um, it's true. And, you know, part of our ministry is we get rid of those things as well. Amen. All right. Next. Blah. God is your defense when you're... Disturbed. Yeah, how many of you know some disturbed people? <laughs> you know when Christians are disturbed? I'll tell you the truth. And for the most part, most people are disturbed when they behave like a selfish child and they cannot get their way. Yeah. Disturbed. How many of you know some disturbed people named you? Okay. Allow your past victories to strengthen your faith and your covenant. How many know that the greatest victory you enjoyed was having Jesus make his home in you and you made your home in him? It's the greatest victory you ever had. All right, next. God is ever mindful of his covenant. Yeah, how many of you believe that? God doesn't sleep. Yeah, we, we like to joke around and say he's taking a nap. He's just resting, all right? Now, because you are in covenant with God, you're always on... Yeah. And you're not far from him because um, you're seated where again? In. You think he's mindful of Jesus? I think so. So if you're in Christ Jesus, is he mindful of you? Yeah. How we can all fit in Christ Jesus though? Go sleep. You're tired. Next. He has blessed you and prepared everything you need. So what do you have need of? Nothing. Good. You guys said I'm right. Nothing. Spell them. Okay. <laughs> uh, you should always have the covenant on your mind. So some of you should go get a piece of paper, write covenant real big, put them on your head. <laughs> that, make sure you tattoo them backward. Spell them right, though. Okay, God promises to never break his covenant. Next, keep going. Let's just go. The definition of profanity is, read that, altering or changing. So don't believe your religious friends when you say the F word and they go, oh, here he is in profanity. That's real profanity is altering or changing when God has said. Hmm. You know, Jesus said in the Bible, Raka, which is closely related to the word taco. I'm just, <laughs> some of you is waiting for the F word, huh? tell the truth. All right, next, some of you are like, what? You guys are too slow, some of you, you got to keep up. God does not change his mind. You know why? He doesn't operate from a mindset. Because he doesn't have a set mind. He has a set heart. Heart set. It's God's will for you to. Amen. So when your pants don't fit, you're lying on the bed trying to pull them up, you are operating very well. So you shut up. How you know? <laughs> I know this. When my sisters were growing up, and it was my turn to wash clothes, and I threw their jeans in the dryer. All hell would break loose. Hell. They'd be like, what the F is wrong with you? You're not your jeans in a giant, you stupid F. -er. You two fine young women in the making, shut up and get out of here. Stupid, not a thing no fit. Now I got to jump around, lie on the bed and try to pull them up. Now I'm not going to be able to button them until lunchtime. And if I eat too much, I'm not going to be able to button them anyway. How about before I wash the clothes, you just tell me not throw them in a dryer? How easy, no? I remember my sister, she had her favorite shirt of all time, and my mom was just, you know what, I'm going to teach you guys how to iron clothes. So I was like, oh, all right, this is going to, all right, you know, iron clothes, great. One extra thing I don't want to do instead of play outside. So she said, you go, you put, put them on the ironing board, and you iron them. And my sister had this shirt, and I was like, Okay, I pulled it over the ironing board and I put the iron on and it all melted right on the iron. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I took the shirt 
And I threw it away. <laughs> and she said, you wash clothes. Where my shirt stand? I'm like, what shirt? My shirt. I don't know what I'm just like, I don't know. And my mom came home. She went to iron her clothes. And she said, what is stuck on the iron? Has all stripes on it. And my sister was standing right there. I was like, mom. You, know, you do the cut neck to your mother. <laughs> and my sister, ah, my shirt. I was called heifer in many languages without the H. Well, I don't know what the moral of that story was. Anyway, let's go. <laughs> All right, God wants to increase you and your children. However, you must fulfill your part of the covenant by being obedient to God and His Word. All right, don't get bored. I'm just practicing for what I got to talk about this weekend. So you guys are my guinea pigs. So that's why we're going a little bit. Okay, next. Obedience brings? The blessing. Good, next. The blessing brings? Increase. Okay. Increase is? God's plan for your life. Keep going. Don't despise small beginnings because your latter end shall? Greatly. Greatly increase. So whatever you're starting now, some people say, Oh, I did ministry, but not too many people was around. I, I went into this neighborhood. Nobody... Who cares? At least you went. Uh, I remember one time they were saying, Oh, we're going to Lanakila housing. We need 500 hot dogs. I was like, Well, I grew up in Lanakila. They're going to like hamburgers, but hot dogs is cool. 500 hot dogs. We went there and only 70 people showed up. They had 430 left. And they're like, Well, I don't know. This was a, I was at another church up the road before. And they were saying, Oh, what a failure, this ministry. Oh, we should have never. I was like, Hey, where I'm looking from, that's prosperity for me. They're like, why, you like the hot dogs? Two words. Damn right. Of course I'm going to take them. Huh? I ate hot dogs for months after that. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's stupid. Everything is a blessing in this world. Amen. How many of you are a blessing? Good, prove it. <laughs> I'm not joking. Anyway. Next, <laughs> survival is not God's plan for life. You know, you hear Christians, well, I'm just making it day by day, praise God. Jesus took care of today, I hope he takes care of tomorrow. These are the kind of people that you stick two fingers in your ear in a Holy Ghost fashion and go, wah, 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 wah. don't listen to those people. Well, hallelujah. In spite of it all, I... Oh, shut up. All right. The survival... Okay, the survival mentality is... Selfish because it's... Uh, mm, you guys know survivalists in the body of Christ? Yeah? What do they always talk about? Me, 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 me. Like Linda guys was telling me in the kitchen that some lady wants to sell their house and then she said she told them that she called me today I was like huh for real that's a call that maybe I don't know maybe my spirit man took a call I don't know evidently she lives in why I lie why you lie <laughs> Why you lie? Why people got to lie for? Did she never think they was going to ask me if she can call? I mean, no, stupid. No. When it comes to increase, God has the world on his mind. So everybody's saying, oh, the finger of God, the hurricane, the tornado, the finger of God. Yeah, okay. So um, God was bored or something. He wanted to kill some people, evidently. You know, there's a preacher in San Antonio that all he talks about is the devil and how the end of the world is going to happen. You, you watch most of these Christian evangelists now, they're talking about the end of the world and how it's going to come and then the meteor is going to come and blow up in nuclear war. And like, what the heck is going through their head? They forgot about living or what? Life more abundantly? Jesus came so that we could have life and life more abundantly? What about the more abundantly? Well, it's going to rain meteors. Um, okay, <laughs> what you going to do? 
If it was me and they said, well, the meteors are coming down, it's going to kill everybody on earth. I'll try and catch one myself, personally. Why not? We're all going to die anyway. Why not? Catch this thing right in the chest. Come on. Man. Yeah, what are you going to do? How are you going to react to that? You have 30 minutes to prepare. The end of the world is near. Biggest meteor in history is going to hit the earth. No, well, let's go outside and enjoy the view because this evidently is the only thing we will ever, ever witness. No other human will ever witness this. Let's go check this out. <laughs> this is it. This is how it ends. Eh? Michael Jackson thought this is it. No, this is it. Right? He's saying this is it. No, I don't know. Let's, uh, let's try and catch it. The song, oh, catch a falling star and put it in your pocket. <laughs> I'm going to put this big one in my pocket. Might have gold on them. Anyway. Well, if the end of the world was happening, what would you do? I'll go to Walmart and raid Walmart. For what? <laughs> Unless you get a big umbrella that can stop the meal. <laughs> I bet you everybody going to start looting. I'm going to grab this TV. Exactly. You see, you see how fruitless the thought is that, yeah, the, maybe we can pray the meteor away. Uh, maybe, but if, if that's it, that's it. What are you going to do now? Yeah, just enjoy the view. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to kiss all the girls I can. I remember we were sixth grade and my friend said, if the end of the world was happening, what would you do? I would go kiss all the girls I can. I said, even the ugly ones? <laughs> all right, not for it. Okay, I'm done.